Hello, everybody. Let's get started. My name is Jim Manico. I'll be your uh, presenter for today. I'm a former board member of the OWASP Foundation. I wrote a book on Java security. Who cares? What matters is that what we talk about in the next week helps you write secure code. That's what matters. And so uh, before we get started, a few of you have asked, what am I wearing on my head? See, I'm from Hawaii. This is called sunglasses. Right? And where I'm from, there's a bright sun in the sky, and we get, it bothers our eyes, so we wear glasses to protect ourselves from the sun. You, I know you, don't, you haven't heard of that in Belgium, but uh, let's, 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 just, let's just move on. Let's just move on. Hello. hello. Oh, my wife is, hi, honey. I, I love you, too. Okay, so OWASP is the Open Web Application <laughs> Security Project. It's a 501c3 not-for-profit charitable organization. Our mission is to make application security visible so people and organizations can make informed decisions about application security risk. That's why you're here. You're here for one of two reasons. Because you, either because you care about application security and writing secure code, or your employer is forcing you to care about application security and secure code. And either of those are a good reason to be here. Uh, either you care about it or you're being forced to care about it. That's usually one of the paths you're going to take. It's usually easier on you if your employer or your, you know, your, your organization forces you to care about this. That's what we want. We want the, the executives of the world to force you to write secure software. That's the real way to be successful in a big organization. But that's not the reality in most of our organizations. In most of our organizations, it's a grassroots effort where it's up to you to care about it. And as you go through your career, I implore you to care about secure software regardless of the influences from up above. This is for your customers, the people you're writing code for. It's for your own integrity as a software engineer, and it's also for your own value in your career. How many are being forced in some way to care about secure software in their work? Who has the influences by their bosses, by their managers, by their organization to write secure software? Who, who is willing to say that right now? Uh, maybe about 25% in the room. For the rest of you, it's up to you to make the choice day to day whether to take the effort to write secure software or not. And it is difficult. It is extremely difficult. I feel most developers who write secure software, they, I call them salmon coders. They're usually a salmon coder. What do I mean by that? What is the main trait of a salmon? The fish, right? What's the main trait of a salmon? How do they swim? What's that? They swim upstream. So even in 2017, where we see the whole world getting hacked, if you want to care about secure software, you're going to have to be a salmon. You're going to have to swim against the stream of your frameworks, of your languages, of the, of the pressures from your bosses to get stuff out the door. You're going to have to swim upstream. And who benefits from that? Your customers, your own integrity, the organization that wants you to get stuff out the door fast, they're going to benefit too. We are in a new era. When SecApp Dev started, what was that, 15 years ago, yo? Is that approximate, approximate? When SecApp Dev started 15 years ago, almost nobody in our industry was really talking about secure software. And the risks that I'm about to talk about were, were barely discussed, were barely even known. So SecApp Dev had an extremely important mission 15 years ago to bring awareness to the world about secure software. Now, where are we today, 15 years from now? We're, we're way ahead of the game. SecApp Dev, in many ways, has accomplished its mission, at least of awareness. The world knows about secure software, and the world of software engineering is aware of these problems. And many of the frameworks and languages that we use today have these defenses built in in some way. So we've accomplished part of the mission. The next part of this mission now is to take what we know and do the work improve the frameworks, do the work of secure coding, continue to learn the minutia of secure software. Before, and the last note is, a lot of what, people like to philosophize like I am now about secure software. Philosophy is cheap, cheap and dirty, it's easy. 
The hard work is what you're going to do on, Monday, on next week. It's when you go back and write code. Secure software is all about design, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it's about minutia. It's about these tiny little details, hundreds of them, hundreds of small details that you as an engineer must master. And some think it's impossible, and I disagree. It takes discipline, work, and study. Who here has seen the movie Doctor Strange? My personal hero. Who here has seen the movie Doctor Strange? You all, first of all, go see the movie Doctor Strange. That's first mission. Second, when, when Doctor Strange, this character in this movie, approached the great mag magicians of the world, and they taught him, they showed him that magic was real. I kind of liken this to writing secure software. And they showed Doctor Strange that magic is real. And he was like, teach me. Please teach me how to do this. And, and they were like, well, how did you learn to be a doctor? By hard work, study, and practice. That's what we have to do. It, when you can write secure software, you are a magician in the world of software engineering. You become an executive. You get higher pay. You become more important to your organization. You wield magic when you write secure software. And what is it going to take you to get there? Is it going to be easy? Absolutely not. Those of us who are instructors this week, we're also students. This is hard stuff. Frank, do you still learn new things about secure software? Every day. So make no mistake, we're going to talk at you like we're experts. We're going to, you know, we're going to, we have the slides. We're going to pretend that we're in charge here. But make no mistakes, we are just students like you. And so what I want you to do is approach this magic. Hard work, study. Discipline, every day, don't give up. And the rewards as you go through your career will be magic. Let's talk about secure software on the web. Defensive control number one, parameterized queries. What is parameterized queries all about? You, what's a parameterized query all about? Tell us. No idea. Who, should we who should we ask about this? Who should we bug about this? Let's go pick on someone. Uh, quick, quick. What's a parameterized query? In any language. What, what risk are we trying to stop here? I'm not, I'm, I, forgive me for picking, let me, let me just drop this. I, don't, I, don't mean, I know it's too early in the morning to, to think. To, a, a parameterized query is usually the first control, the, the first defensive layer that any secure developer is going to learn. This is the very first control. Go ahead. The first could. What's that? It's meant to stop SQL injection. Here's a famous cartoon called Bobby Tables. I actually think this is funny. Hi, your son's school. We're having some trouble. Did he break something? Did you really name your student your your, your son Robert Drop Table Students? Yeah, we call him Little Bobby Tables. Well, we've lost this year's student's record. I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. Ha, ha, ha. A famous cartoon in the world of application security. There are such things. But this is a wrong cartoon. This is technically incorrect. When you're trying to stop SQL injection, sanitizing input is a weak and ineffective, or better yet, an incomplete layer of defense. What we need to do, what we need to do, is, here's what I'm trying to say. Look at this email address right here. Is this a legal, valid email address? Absolutely it is. If you use the HTML5 regular expression for the email field, this is the most popular validation layer for email addresses, then this will pass. This will be legal. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm, if you do single quote dash dash at manico.net, I'll respond to you later. This is a real email address. And if you use the defensive layer of validation only, this will be a valid email address. But is this a safe email address? Absolutely not. If we try to take this email address and update a user record with that email address, and we just use string building to shove that email address into that SQL statement, update users, set email to be a certain email address for a certain user ID, then we're going to get this problem here. We're going to get this. Update users, set email, is this malformed email address for a certain ID? And what the database sees is this. 
the database sees update user set email is quote, quote. Everything else there, let's go back a step. The dash dash in this, in this SQL statement, it ends the rest of the statement. It comments it out. And so now, I just dropped the email address from the entire database table, basically shutting this website down in many circumstances. This is what happens when you use validation layers to try to do security. I believe that you can do good security with no validation at all. That's an extreme point. But security in software is not about doing validation layers. It's going to be about escaping. It's going to be about encoding. It's going to be about good access control, good authentication, proper use of these next generation protocols, handling some of the minutia. And a lot of books that I've read say, do validation, that's how you do security. And I'm saying that's wrong. Here's an, exa and here's an example of where a developer depended on validation and they, and they failed to, to secure the code. We want to write code like this, right? We want to write code like this. This is a prepare, this is a parameterized query in what language is this? What am I, uh, PHP, the most common language in the world today that drives the web by far. A little bit scary. Again, if we look at the web, look at the world of the web, it's almost all driven by PHP. I know we, we, it doesn't get a lot of press. We talk about Python and Rails and all these other new fancy languages, but WordPress and PHP drives the web more than any other technology. And this is the PHP PDO library doing a parameterized query that will absolutely stop SQL injection even if attacks get to these individual endpoints. So we see placeholders, new email, oh, I got a little, we got new email address, which is a placeholder. We have user ID, which is a placeholder. And we're binding the actual untrusted data into those placeholders, and injection goes away, even if attacks get to these variables. Are any of our instructors going to talk about SQL injection in your courses? And let me do a quick poll. Is anyone here, would anyone here like to hear more about basic risks like SQL injection? Look, there's no shame when I ask this. Who here would benefit for, with instruction that talks about SQL injection in more depth and how to fix it? Who would benefit from that? Who thinks it's too light of a topic? Who already knows about that? Yo, take a quick note of that. About half the class would have liked to have heard about that. And we tend to go a little bit above that. So some of the basics is probably something, a basic module would benefit this group a great deal. And there's no shame in that. We all. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a yoga instructor, believe it or not, the fattest yoga instructor in the planet. And I go back to take basic classes on a regular basis. I'll show you fancy poses later. Yes, I can do full splits, even at 300 pounds. Let's move on. This is, uh, this is, this is SQL injection uh, uh, parameterized queries being done in .NET, right? We're doing the same binding with, here we go, with the at name and at password, those are placeholders where we want to shove user data into. And there's the actual parameterized steps. This is where we take untrusted data and bind it into these two different fields, which are placeholders in the query. Why does this kind of programming stop SQL injection? Let's go into it. It's all about how a database processes SQL. When you assemble a SQL query with string building, and then shove it into the database, the database will just run that query. But when you do a parameterized query, it's going to process that query in two steps. Step number one, step number one is going to be, step number one is going to be, it's going to, it's going to compile essentially, build a query plan for the placeholder query that should contain no untrusted data. It's just a, a string that you're writing in code. And so, this gets compiled first, and a query plan is built for that placeholder query. And then step two, the untrusted data. That's the real danger, these different text fields here. That's just open text from .NET. That can contain the attack. That's what we're worried about. So in step two, the untrusted data is fed into that basically pre-compiled query plan. The query plan is already built and it's impossible to change it after that initial query plan is built. So as untrusted data, even with a live attack, is sent into that pre-compiled query plan, the attack is neutralized because a query is already compiled. 
This has been effective for 20 years now. We had this in Perl, even at the dawn of the web. Here we have it in Java. Here we have it in hibernate query languages when talking to NoSQL databases. And here we have it in good old Perl. Anybody still working with Perl in their work at all? Anybody? OK, so let's move on. So all right, no Perl. So, so that's SQL injection. Every single variable that you put into a query must be done through a parameterized query. It will stop the most dangerous risk to web apps and web services, SQL injection. It will improve the performance of your code. It will make your code faster. It will make the, the queries run faster as well. Let's look at risk number two, and, or sorry, let's look at defensive strategy number two, encoding all data before we use it in a parser. So here we have the basic risk of, of cross-site scripting. These are a couple different attacks that I could inject into a website. And the, how, do, how would I do that? If I'm an attacker and I want to get my evil scripts into your web code, how would I do that? Here's an example. I may go to my user profile. I may edit my user profile. I'll add this code to my user profile and wait for someone to look at me in social media. Now, I have, a prop, I have no friends in social media, so that, that attack's not going to work. So what I can do next is I'll go contact the administrator and say, hey, there's a problem with my profile. Can you take a look at it? And then the administrator looks at my profile, and while they're an admin, they execute this code right here. Who here does web development and builds HTML? So are you ready to play? <laughs> You're ready to play. What's this code going to do? Walk me through it slowly. That's what else do we need to say? That's exactly correct. This attack code will take, remember, I put this in my profile, and then an administrator looks at it to check my profile out. So now the administrator's cookie, document.cookie, is added to a URL, step one. Step two, an image object in JavaScript is created, and then step three, we preload that image with the bad URL, sending the administrator's cookie to my website where I can collect that cookie. What happens if I can steal a copy of the administrator's cookie? You. If I can steal an administrator's cookie, what can I do with that? Uh, Tell me more. Yeah, exactly. Then I, I become an administrator, and now I can conduct actions as if I was the administrator as long as they stay logged in, basically. That, that session is active usually until someone logs out. Unless you're using something like OAuth, which is not meant for authentication or session management, and they give you tokens that don't really have expiration. That's a whole different story. Let's not even go there yet. We'll go there later. Throughout the day, um, I'll talk about, throughout the course, I'll do a course on OAuth. Yo will, take a, will, will deliver a module on OpenID Connect. I highly recommend you go to both of those. Uh, my talk, where my talk ends, Yo's talk will begin, and they, they complement each other well. So this is cross-site scripting. Almost every website on the planet is vulnerable to this in some way. How do we stop it? We stop it primarily, and, and again, the, the number of attacks we can do through cross-site scripting is dramatic. I can set up keystroke loggers, steal any data, run scripts from third-party sites. This is a big deal, right? So how do we stop this? Well, what does your browser think of this character, first of all? When your browser gets this character, what does the browser think you're trying to do? So does your browser think of this character as display data or as code, for the most part? How do I trick the browser into thinking that this piece of code is just display data? You escape it. You convert it to an HTML entity or some other escaped character, depending on the context. This is the less than HTML entity. It will display a less than symbol without treating it like code. So when we have this attack, this terrible attack, and if you escape all data 
before putting it into your user interface, you convert that data from a form that can execute to a form that will display safely. That's the heart of stopping any injection attack. That's the heart of stopping cross-site scripting. That's the heart of stopping LDAP injection. That's the heart of stopping different XML injection attacks, and so on. We have these libraries built into .NET from almost 15 years ago. This is the .NET um, anti-XSS or encoder library. We have OWASP projects that do this. We, we're up to, ver I'm, I'm, this is an old slide, my apology. We just released version 1.2.1 a couple days ago, a little performance enhancement. But this is a Java library to help you do escaping in a user interface. We have all these different contexts. What makes this a little bit more difficult is that for every slot in an HTML document, we need a different kind of escaping. So these libraries provide several different kinds of escaping functions. It's a little tricky. It's only difficult until you figure it out, right? When you first look at this, I need to escape in all these contexts, it's a little bit overwhelming. When you've been doing it for about an hour or two, it gets easy fast. It's not that difficult. And so when we have these escaping libraries in every major language, Go does it automatically, Angular does some of it automatically, Scala, Anti-XSS, PHP, there's escapers for every single major language. And there's also escapers in these other secondary forms of injection as well, which we'll just skip for now. So that's, that's two. Number one, parameterize all your queries. Number two, escape everything in a user interface. And number three, or in fact, escape anything before you put it into a parser, basically, to neutralize that potential attack. And I, I mentioned that input validation is not the most important control. I give it number three in my list. We still want to do input validation. And what I like to say is you don't need to do input validation for secure software. I'm just trying to, uh, I'm trying to push a point a little bit extreme. But let's, let's talk about this. We still want to do input validation. Pretty much any piece of input that enters your software, we should have a rule system for it. For example, what would be the rules for a username in a piece of software? Let's, just, let's, let's work on this together right now. So I have a username field. What usernames should we accept and which one should we, we, we should not? What do you think? Let's do this right now. Go ahead, sir. So let's go letters and numbers. Uh, are you talking about ASCII letters? So you just upset 99% of the non-English speaking world, right? So let's, let's say we're doing US English only. That's fine. So ASCII, uh, we'll do ASCII, we'll do uh, letters and numbers only, uppercase, are you doing case sensitive? Let's say, okay, we'll accept all UTF-8 characters. That's probably a bit better. What kind of range do you want to accept? H what's the smallest username and what's the largest username? Let's say three to 20 characters, sure. So we're gonna say three to 20 characters of anything in the UTF-8 character set. You're, you're now accepting control characters. Is that okay for a username? I'm gonna say no, so I'm gonna strip out control characters. So I'm gonna say UTF-8, printable characters only, and I have to make sure now that every single one of my user interface web pages is of type UTF-8. I also need to make sure that the username doesn't collide with other usernames as well. It must be a new username. So that simple validation rule for a username, it's actually complex. So it's, it's, non, it's non trivial. Many websites have gotten bitten by that actually, where they allowed UTF-8 usernames and in some places, they would go to lowercase, letting attackers register usernames that already existed in the system. So just be careful with that stuff. It, it's challenging. So I digress. Let's get into this. One of the forms of validation that's fundamental is dealing with HTML input. When we look at many websites and web services, they provide administrative endpoints where I can submit HTML to the server. One of the most common ways to do that is through a library called TinyMCE. 
this converts text areas to WYSIWYG editors. So I can do bold and links and bullet points and colors and all the stuff rich text would expect. So here, I have hit submit on that field. And what's being submitted to the server is a big chunk of HTML5. So if someone is submitting a chunk of HTML5 to your server, how do you ensure that there's no evil JavaScript in that HTML? This is the security question. It's on your plate. You're at work. The boss is looking at your code. Time is short. We got, we got a lot on the line. And then we have this feature. It's very insecure. And you have to fix it. How do you solve this problem? Oh, I'm sorry? Now, be careful here. The, what he mentioned was encoding. If I have this chunk of HTML and I encode it, what, what's it going to look like on screen? It's going to look like HTML. If I encode this P tag, what we will see on screen is that P tag, and it won't render, it will be safe. There'll be no attack, but you would have broken the app. In order for this feature to work, this HTML needs to render. And if I escape it, that's the whole point of escaping. I stop it from rendering. So I can't escape it. I can't encode it. I need something else. I'm sorry? What he just said was, let's parse the HTML to look for JavaScript. That's closer. That's closer. If we try to parse the HTML and just look for evil JavaScript, that's called a blacklist pattern. We're looking for attack data. Here's a better way. Let's, and, and this is the, 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 probably the best way to do it. I mean with respect, sir. Let's set up a, 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 a sanitizer. It's usually called sanitizing. Let's set up a set of rules that tells us which tags are good, right? In this case, we say the image tag is good, the alt tags and source attributes are OK, these attributes are OK, and everything else will get stripped out. That's more of a whitelist pattern, a positive validation pattern. And don't try to do this by hand yourself. You want to do this with a formal HTML sanitizer. They exist in every language. In Java, we have the OWASP project. Ruby on Rails has a built-in sanitizer. .NET has a few third-party libraries that are decent. There's a Bleach project in Python. They're all over the place. So if you're allowing users to submit HTML to you that needs to be rendered to other users, then we want to do sanitizing, a specialized form of validation. Remember, the minutia, these little details, is what you need to master to be a secure coder, right? And so let's, let's jump ahead here. Number four. Yes, yes, please. Yes, what I was trying to say is blacklist is bad overall. I mean, it, it's, it's OK. Whitelist validation is the, is the better security layer. Blacklist validation will detect attacks. Both together are OK, but whitelist validation is going to be more important. And there are many cases where whitelist validation fails to give you security, though. So be careful. Many books, many courses I've taken, they would say that whitelist validation, positive validation, provides security. That's very dangerous. Remember the first example with email addresses in the beginning? That's whitelist validation. That doesn't secure you. So I just say be careful about depending on validation for security. This is one case where it does work. Almost every other case, it doesn't. It reduces the attack surface. It makes it more difficult for the attacker to be successful, but it's not going to provide perfect security. Just be careful. Let me jump ahead here. Number four, Frank, our favorite topic. Everyone's favorite topic, access control. This is like the nervous system of your code. In many of these other areas, we'll talk about security. You can make a mistake and fix it later, and all is well. When it comes to access control, this is an extremely design 
heavy layer. If you get this wrong early on and they have to go back and fix it, it's often extremely painful and expensive if you have to change the whole design. So I want to recommend when you're building access control, especially into a complex piece of software, go out of your way to design this and prototype this extremely carefully. The access control that we've been tasked to use in most of our languages and frameworks is role-based access control. Role-based access control where, not the ANSI standard or the, or the European standard for role-based access control, but the, the poor implementation where you're asked to hard code roles in your code. Okay, let, let's have a moment of security confessions. We're at a Catholic university. This is a great place for security confessions. Who here has hard coded roles all throughout their code in their work in the past? I sure have. Frank, come on, admit to your sins, admit to your sins. Now you're going to raise your hand. Never. I will never admit to my sins. Okay, all right. We're going to talk about, we'll talk to you later. <laughs> but this is, a, this, this is an anti-pattern. We want to avoid hard coding roles in code for a lot of reasons. It, it, it takes the policy and literally hard codes it, which is a bit, we want to usually decouple the policy. It makes things like horizontal, it doesn't even address horizontal access control. It doesn't address multi-tenancy. And suppose you have to change your policy. Sir, I see you're getting, he's getting tired. This guy in the back did one of these. You know, he's getting tired. Dude, we're like in the first half an hour. You're not allowed to be tired yet. <laughs> no, you need more coffee. A little more coffee for you, buddy. So, so where were we? <laughs> where were we? <laughs> yeah, you got, let's, let's, how many hours are left? It's like four, four days and seven hours, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, pace yourself, buddy, pace yourself. Where were we? Yeah, hard coding roles. This is one of the biggest anti-patterns in access control. Don't you agree with me, Frank? No, you're not going to agree. So be, be been there before. Or, even, or my, my favorite access control anti-pattern, I was auditing a very large, highly sensitive piece of software for a large organization, and we're reviewing this code, and we're like, we're looking for the access control layer. Where is it? And they're like, oh, we, don't, we didn't do that yet. You know, you log in, you get everything. We'll, we'll fix that later. <coughs> okay, all right, all right. So be careful. When you, what happens when you're hard coding roles in code? What, hap, what do you have to do when that policy changes? push new code that's non-trivial in most situations and test it. Hope you didn't break anything, right? You will break something. Let's just move on here. Here's, here's, what, I, here's what I see as old school, relatively bad access control. We have a feature we want to see if a user is allowed to wield a lightsaber. Has everyone here seen the Star Wars movies? Has anyone here not seen Star Wars before? Anyone here never seen Star Wars? All right, you get the out of my class. Just get out, out, just get out. Goodbye, you're out. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. In Star Wars, you have like these warriors doing battle with something called a lightsaber. It's, it's a sword made out of a big laser, right? If I, light, if I light up this sword of a laser and I give it to you, what's your TTL? What's your time to live? It's about five minutes and then you're done. It's a laser, it's not a toy, right? It's a sword. So only a Jedi, it's a kind of warrior in this movie, is allowed to wield a lightsaber. You've really never seen Star Wars. <laughs> Have you seen Spaceballs? You know what, skip the Star Wars movies, just go watch Mel Brooks' Spaceballs movie, that's all you need, and you'll, and you'll be caught up fast. Okay, all right, so where were we, I'm sorry. So in this code, a user is trying to wield a lightsaber. It's a dangerous weapon. So we want to only make sure that certain characters can wield this weapon. If the user is a Jedi or a Padawan or a Sith Lord or a Jedi killing cyborg, who's a Jedi killing cyborg in Star Wars? Who is that? General... What's that? That guy? You should all be ashamed of yourselves. High five. 
Good answer. It's, Gen it's General Grievous. General Grievous. All right. So every time I have to change, after, every time I have to change this game, I have to change this code in 5,000 locations. And then Disney buys this game. They want to replace the characters with Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. I'm not kidding. It's what happens. We have to change this whole entire code base. This is hard coding a policy for one specific app. It makes multi-tenancy, many different tenants in the same code not possible. It also doesn't provide data contextual access control rules. It's highly limited. And the trend in software is not to be simple. The trend in software is to be extremely complicated. To provide services for multiple customers and entities is pretty much the norm in professional software development. What we need is something like this. This is basically a capability model for access control. What we're saying here is, if the user is permitted to wield a lightsaber, let him do it. This has nothing to do with the policy. It's just a placeholder to look up into a database or storage mechanism to look for what the rule's going to be for this user, this tenant, and this particular feature. And if you look at .NET, it's been built in for 15 years. If you look at Java, it doesn't exist. You have to write this yourself from scratch or use a product like Apache Shiro or something else. And this is, again, this is a called using a capability for an enforcement point with an access control. This is going to be the first step in the heart of building modern access control in next generation software. If you start here, all the other challenges of modern access control are going to be much easier to deal with. So, so something to think about. Here we have an example of what I mean by a data contextual access control check. The user is trying to drive a Winnebago, right? And we're saying, if the user is permitted to drive a certain Winnebago, let them do it. And my checks are right here. We're saying, if the user can drive Winnebago of that particular ID, then let them do it. I can support 10 different kinds of applications, and I could push the actual rules to a database, and I'll never have to change this code ever again. So in your code, all these places where you're doing access control checks, don't put the policy in the code. Point to a database. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a fundamental design decision as more and more users and tenants use your software. And I, I used to do roles. Even when I start with a simple application, I code this way now. Build a basic database behind it because simple software always gets complicated in my experience as a professional developer. How am I doing on time? How much time do I have, sir? You with the camera there, guy. You with the camera. You have no idea. All, d all day as far as you care. OK, I, I don't think anyone in the room agrees with you. But uh, <laughs> 45 minutes? Oh, great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sit down. I'm going to sit down for this next one. All right. Let's talk about the next one, establishing, establishing authentication and identity controls. We could spend a whole week just talking about this topic. Oh, wait, we're pretty much going to. OK, good. So this area of establishing user identity is actually a giant area. It involves authentication, involves session management, it involves delegation, it involves federation, this is actually one of the most complicated parts of application development, especially for a large enterprise, and it's only getting more complicated. Right now, the main protocol that's being introduced to the world is OAuth and OpenID Connect. These are next generation delegation and federation standards. They are the most misused protocols in the history of security. Every single use of OAuth I have ever seen is completely misused. And we're going to spend time talking about that. So please be careful in this area. If you are touching authentication code, if you as a developer are messing with authentication code, session management code, delegation code, or federation code, you better have a damn good reason to be touching that code. It requires an incredibly deep and sophisticated security expertise to get even a basic login page coded in a secure fashion. This is usually something that many organizations don't want to code anymore. 
They'll buy products like Ping Identity or use open source products or try to buy their way or use a library to provide these features for them. So just in general, if you're, if you're working on authentication code, one of two things is happening. Either you're, you're an architect with deep security mastery or you're gonna have multiple rounds of review of your code before it goes live, just to set this up. Because this is something that the average developer who's just coming out of school, I mean with respect, shouldn't be touching. You make one small mistake in these layers and it's game over, game over. Rest in peace, Bill Paxton, wherever you are. Right. Bill Paxton, the actor from the Aliens movie, passed away a few days ago. He's well known from the Aliens movie the grenade in hand yelling, game over, man, game over. So that's an honor to him as an actor. We miss him. So that's for, uh, no one caught that reference. We're going to move on. It's OK. When you're doing password storage, attackers, if they ever steal your password storage database, they're going to throw super computers and specialized open source software at that password storage mechanism to attempt to crack your passwords. With about 5,000 euros worth of resources today, we can attempt about a trillion different basic hashes, about SHA-1, about a billion per second. So suppose you're storing, I had a, a situation where one of my customers many years ago was storing their passwords with SHA-1, and I said it was insecure, so they changed it to SHA-2, and I'm like, this did not fix the problem. They did not believe me, so they gave me their part of their database to try to crack. And some of the passwords are very long. I used <clears throat> this rig, all video game cards, and Hashcat to try to crack it a few years ago. When I loaded up the million accounts, they gave me one million accounts, some with tough passwords. I loaded it into this rig, and I fired it up. I ran all the common passwords I knew against it, then began to brute force it. The rig would fire up. My wife would yell at me because it would, it would, it would squeal. It's just a you know, poorly air-conditioned machine. Everything's at max. I overclocked everything. It's, it's screaming. It's going. It would fire up and then go right back down. And I'm like, what's wrong with this thing? I spent a day debugging it. You know what the problem was? It was done, it was done in under a second. It was done in a second. A million accounts took me 0.7 seconds. To, the the fire-up time of the software took longer than the actual cracking. So I was lucky. Many of the long passwords they pulled from other password dumps is how, is how, I, got, is how I was successful in that. So let's talk about password storage. And I, I'm, I'm going to actually, to make up some time, I'm going to skip this. I have... Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do something a bit awkward here. I'm, I'm gonna break out of this. This is in the last couple of weeks. I've updated my material on this. Let, let, let me let me try to call, let me try to see if I can pull this off. I want to give you the most up to date information on password storage. Let me see if I can pull this off real quick. How am I gonna pull this off? I can do this. So I'm gonna go to so I'm gonna go to my authentication deck. I, I'm, and, and this is this is good because. I literally just updated all my slides on this topic, and I think that password storage is so important. I want to get this right. I want to do something that's, that's relatively modern here. So here we go. Let me find this. All right, we got this. We got this. Someone's like, are you using your phone? Yes, I'm using my phone. There it is. Let's do this. Boom. All right. Boom, let's get cracking, right? There's, the, there's different hardware crackers. Again, let's, let's take a step back. The user has given you a password. You're now going to store that password in your database in some way. And now the attacker has stolen your database. How long is it going to take an attacker to crack the password? That's the question on the table. It's not an attack that's against your online service. Your database was already stolen in part. The passwords in your database are in the hands of attackers. How long will it take them to hack your system? It should take them weeks or months, hopefully, if you're using a good password storage mechanism. And here's my here are my recommendations for really good password storage. Let's do this. Number one, don't limit the password strength. 
Limiting passwords to protect against injection is doomed to failure. Many websites will say, you may not put a single quote in the password. You may not put a, a dash in a password because you're worried about injection attacks. This is a terribly bad strategy because you're weakening the user's password policy because you're not willing to write secure code. Just doesn't make any sense. You want, we, we want to use encoding and parameterization to stop injection, not limiting characters. Very large passwords will cause denial of service though. We want to make sure that we have a maximum for password size. About 4,000 characters is what some frameworks choose. So even a 4,000 character password is going to be non-harmful to your software. It's plenty big enough for even password managers. And we don't want to allow common passwords. I, rec I recommend you do things like take the dump from Sony. Take the password dumps from RockU, from eBay. There's literally billions of passwords that have been lost in the wild. You can collect those passwords off of Pastebin, put them in a database, sort them, and take the top like uh, top like 100,000 passwords and never let your users use those passwords. That technique alone will protect your passwords better than anything else we see out there. So, th so that's step number one. Step number two, you got to use a modern password policy scheme. The NIST organization, which in the US we tend to like, in everywhere else in the world, the trust of NIST is gone because of the Snowden affair. Sorry about that. So let's just move on here. I still think these recommendations are very sensible. I'm going to go through them anyways. I want you to consider the new password policy suggestions for digital media protection that was published just a few months ago. We'll look at those in just a moment. Consider password topology research from some of the more modern uh, uh, presentations on password storage security. I'm going to skip that for now. And never depend upon passwords by themselves anymore. What should we be doing in our software? Is username, password good for security anymore? What should we be doing? Some other factor, either, you know, either, uh, and frankly, what we think of as good multi-factor, the, the TOTP function, the one-time password, numeric data entry multi-factor, that's no longer recommended. That is very weak, and I recommend you stop doing that. So here's, here's recommendations. Number one, the recommendations from NIST are about favoring the user. Let's not put difficulty on the user that's not realistic. Let's do that work ourselves. So at least eight character passwords, up to 64 maybe. Um, check against a list of bad passwords, like commonly used passwords. Don't force unnatural combinations of special characters. They do nothing to help the user build a good password. Uh, don't use password hints anymore. This makes no sense. Let's drop all password hints from our software. Don't use password questions, security questions. These are things we can look up on Facebook. They don't provide good security. And no more mandatory, no more mandatory expiration of passwords for the sake of it. They add extra work on the user without doing anything to help with security. The only time you want to expire passwords is in the event of a breach. Then we must force users to reset their passwords. These are the brand new recommendations. And at least people I know in the security industry, there is a big applause from this. This is the first time I have ever seen a reasonable password strategy from a standard body. Yes, sir. I like 4,000. This is their recommendation. They're saying at minimal eight and at least allow 64 character passwords. But we're going to use a reduction algorithm, a kind of hash basically. So even a 4,000 character password will be reduced to the same field size. So I don't like that 64 character either. I use about 4,000 as my maximum. This is what the Django framework did to stop denial of service. So I use that recommendation. It's reasonable. Also, don't use SMS or TOTP for multi-factor anymore. It's easily fishable. And this is what most of us do. This is what I do in my own software. 
They're recommending a migration to FIDO type of techniques. My, it's time to shift to individual dedicated keys like YubiKeys for authentication. That's the recommendation if you want secure software. I agree, it's not easy. You know, I, I know most of us aren't even doing multi-factor yet. We're still doing password security. This is the NIST recommendations from November. I think it's extremely wise it, and it behooves us to, to follow these recommendations if we want really secure software, okay? Also, allow all printable ASCII characters, this is for you, including spaces and even emoji. How do you like emoji for passwords? Awesome, super awesome, right? There we go. Let me jump ahead here a bit. Let me make up. We, we got time for this. Let me jump up a bit. Oh, yeah, one note. This is some of the best research I've seen for password storage. It's called password topology research. Let me ask you a question. Who has the following password pattern? Your first character is an upper, uppercase letter. The next couple of characters are lowercase characters. Your last character, your second to last character is a number, and the last character is a special character. Who has that basic topology? No one that's gonna admit to it, a few. We're now all in the same password topology bucket, and it makes it easier for attackers to use brute force techniques to figure out our passwords. The best, re the newest mathematical research I've seen says, separate user passwords into multiple topology buckets. This is non-trivial, it's a non-solved issue, it's hard to build code to do this, but if you like to look at the edge of research on password security, this is a good presentation, very compelling research on the mathematics of password choices. Is this a good password, by the way? No, no, let me ask a different question. Will your system that you're working on today accept this password? There's a better question. Will it? Why should your software reject this password? Why should your software reject this password. What characteristic does this password have that no password should ever have? And here's a hint. Password. It's got a dictionary word right in the middle of it. That's the problem. We have a uppercase letter, a lowercase letter, a number, a special character, and it's 10 characters. That fits most of our policies. But we need to ensure especially smaller passwords do not contain dictionary words. If it's a longer password, like 50 characters, who cares? But for a short password, we have got to get dictionary words out of our passwords. We should have a ban list of common passwords. So, number three. 30 minutes left, thank you, perfect. Hash the password with a modern hashing algorithm. So, the recommendation is to use bcrypt, is the best recommendation today for most software. <coughs> there are other algorithms like S-Crypt and Argon2i, next generation algorithms. Most of us using Bcrypt will be making a good choice for password storage. The reason we want to use Bcrypt over a basic hash, it's slow. We can make it adaptive. We can give it a work factor to slow it down. Your work factor should be at least a 10, Preferably a 13 or more when using bcrypt. We also want to use a salt. This is so even when you and I have the exact same password, the ciphertext in the database is going to be different. Bcrypt has a salt built into it. Also, um, yeah, use an adapt. I, I, I did something wrong. Let me take a step back. If we look at number three, what we're really trying to say here is before you use bcrypt, just do a simple hash against your password. Why? My, my, let me correct myself, I'm sorry. When you have a, like a 5,000 or 4,000 character password, bcrypt will often truncate that and weaken the storage. So what we recommend is take your large password, first hash it to get it to a consistent size, then run it through bcrypt. That's gonna be the, the best pattern. A hash by itself is weak for password security, but if you hash it, and then use the adaptive algorithms like pvkdf2 or bcrypt, it tends to be a very good combination from a security point of view that still supports very large passwords, even with this truncation problem with bcrypt. 
And last, yeah, here's, so here's the basic workflow. Let's do it one more time. Number one, hash the password. Step two, um, salt it with, with a, a random string attached to that user account. Number three, run it through bcrypt with a strong work factor, 10 or more. And then that, that, that value is stored in the database. This is the basics for password storage. I believe you'll hear more about this throughout the week from, from other instructors. Let me go back to my main presentation here. Sorry about that. Where are we? All right, let's do this. So we're taking a step back. We're going back to Sec App Dev 2017, back to the OWASP controls. Any questions about anything I've talked about so far? Are you with me, everyone? Are you with me? Yes, I'm with you. I, my coffee has not kicked in yet, or I'm supposed to be in the, uh, the lawyer class at the Irish College. I'm in the wrong place. I'm out of here. So where are you? Where are you all right, everyone? Doing all right? All right, good, 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 good. I'm at the Irish College where the, the future lawyers and politicians of, uh, of Ireland are, uh, um, are, all, are all studying law. I, I snuck into, into one of the classes yesterday, yo. They have weekend classes, and they kicked me out. I don't know why. All right. Where are we? What's that? Because everybody else was 18. All right. All right, that's why. I was just curious. All right, all right where am I? Where are we? Hang on, hang on. Where are we? Where are we? We are implement access controls. We did that one. Establish. There uh, uh, we go. Let's go here. Oh. All right. All right. Establish authentication identity controls. Store your passwords in a secure fashion. We did that already. Do forgot password correctly. Here's another main feature. I had someone email me recently saying, I'm looking for a way to do forgot password with easy usability. Can you help me? And I wrote back and said, you're barking up the wrong tree, right? When I look at the forgot password feature, I'm not, I don't care about usability. I'm going to tell you about security, which is often going to harm usability. The more usable you make forgot password, the more insecure it's going to be. So I recommend if you're doing forgot password, look at the OWASP for, uh, forgot password cheat sheet, which this is based off of. It will encourage you to add a multi-factor component step before you let users reset the password. They show up. You, they, they give you their username or their account number. You then send them a you, you, you demand they give you a multi-factor check in some way, and then you let them reset the password. That's basically what the steps most banks will take. Go take a look at the OWASP Forgot Password Cheat Sheet. It will talk about this in depth. Another, another interesting control, which I think is very underused, is re-authentication. We're going over the minutia of application security here. Whenever a user tries to reset their password or change their password or conduct a sensitive financial transaction or do an administrative action, usually you want to ask the user to, to re-enter their password or credential in some way. This is a very powerful control. It's a bit of a usability hit, but it's a very powerful control. Here we have Meetup, Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm just trying to change my email address, and they're all making me verify my password again. Why? Again, I'm just trying to change my email address, and every single one of these services wants my password before they allow it. Why? Go ahead. What's your name? Ha you, you, yes? Yes with an H. What's, what's up? Yes with an H. I agree, but take, take a step back with me here, right? This feature is just change email address. It's like edit account, and then I change my email address, and they're making me change my, and they're making me verify my password again. It's not, it's not a cookie problem. If, if I'm an attacker, and I can force you to change your email address to an email address that I know is, that I control as the attacker, why is that dangerous? Bingo. What does almost every website do for password recovery? 
they email you a link, you click on it, and you can change the password. What do you think of that process from a security point of view? It's garbage. Almost every website that does forgot password has made it weaker than the main login page. So what I recommend is, I think the, first of all, go look at the forgot password cheat sheet. Add a multi-factor component into your password recovery feature. And two, anytime someone tries to edit a user profile, force, the, force a real authentication check. These are usually reasonable controls for secure software. Fair? You with me? Good. Let's jump ahead. And this is just a giant topic. At the OWASP Foundation, there's a series of cheat sheets I recommend you look into. Authentication, password storage from John Stephen from Sigital, forgot password written by a, a series of us. Keep this a guide up to date. The session management cheat sheet written by Raul Siles, one of the best I've ever seen. And then the, um, the ASVS, the Application Security Verification Standard on Authentication and Session Management. Incredibly well done. I also see the MASVS, almost done. This is the mobile application security verification standard. When we did the ASVS, we did it once and we were good with it. The mobile team is like, they're, they're wordsmithing every single sentence and debating it. So the level of detail is even stronger. Look at the MASVS for other authentication and session management requirements. As a quick aside, how do you define secure software today? That's my question. Who wants to play? What do you define secure software to be today? Who wants to play? Yo, you want to go? That's a good answer, but it's, it's a philosophical answer to some degree. And that's, that, that's a fair answer, no, no disrespect. If you told me that as a developer, it's hard for me to act on that, right? It's, it's a, I, think it's a good, I think it's a good philosophy. It's a sound philosophy. You know what you're talking about. It's hard for me to act on that. Try, let's go again. Someone else. How do we define secure software? Who wants to play? Go ahead. Immutable, uh, immune to all known attacks. I mean, again, that's, that, that's a good goal. It doesn't help me as a developer write secure software. It gives me a philosophy to follow. It gives me a, a, a pointer in the right direction. When I'm writing code, it does nothing to help me. Here's what I want to challenge you. Here's my definition of secure software. Secure software is a, is a, is a piece of software that specifically follows approximately 200 requirements on how to build security features into your software in a proper way. So I, can, I take secure software away from this philosophical goal and bring it down to just a list of requirements. That's it, that's all it is. If someone tells me to build parameterized queries in all of my database access code as a developer, I'll do it. If someone tells me exactly how to do access control, I'll do it, right? If you give me requirements that define security features of software in a complete way, I will attempt to follow those requirements. Look at the ASVS standard. It's the Application Security Verification Standard. It's a list of approximately 200 requirements that defines what secure software should look like. Now, we've gone away from philosophy, and I, I'm a philosopher too. Literally, I have a degree in philosophy. I am a philosopher, ha, -ha. So, so I like these philosophies, and I agree with both of you. But when I'm working with teams of developers, I convert that philosophy into a clear recipe for what they need to do to write secure software. And this is not a perfect approach. It's, it's still lacking in some details, but now we've taken, we've moved from philosophy to science, yeah, science, yeah. You like science, right, Leo? You're, you're a scientist, would you say, yo? So now, now we're getting closer to that, right? We're now describing the recipe that we need for secure software, and I think that approach is gonna be more effective. It's gonna help us build controls specific to this list, and uh, 
And again, don't just take this list and use it. Go fork it for your team. And now you have a list of requirements for your team that all of your testers, managers, designers, and developers will follow to build that recipe for secure software. This is one of the first steps in building secure software is having everyone being on the same page as to what that is, right? Number six, data protection and privacy, right? In the US, we care about data protection. In the US, most of our efforts are about, uh, about providing security to enterprise software. Europe is more privacy centric than US, right? We, do, we really don't care about privacy in the US. In fact, the trend with our new administration is to go even farther away from that. The laws that have been set up in the US to force privacy with our telecoms FCC are all being stripped down now. It's just the unfortunate truth of the world. Europe is very different though. If I do not build software with incredibly strong privacy features, the financial penalties are dramatic, like 1% of my global turnover, my global gross is some of the fines are dramatic. 4%, 4%. So it's 4%, that was, that, that, is that in law or still being approached? It's now in law. Just in the last few years, it's went to law, right? Yeah, it takes effect 2018. It takes effect 2018. 4% of your global gross financial turnover is the potential penalty if you intentionally or negligently abuse the privacy of your customers. Did I get that right? Yeah. Now, in those cases, you get the severe. If you, I'm sorry? If you don't take the severe no. severe. That's the language they, they ended up with in the law? Yeah. Wow. What, what time is that section? I'll, I'll be there. What time is that? Right before and right after lunch. This is the part. Perfection. I highly recommend all of you go to this. This is where secure software meets modern law. And if you don't follow these laws, the damage to your company is dramatic. So that's what pr privacy matters. So we want to do TLS. I'm not going to go into TLS right now. There's we have multiple sessions on TLS at SecApp Dev this week. I highly recommend you go to them. We'll, they'll talk about all these details and give you, there's also a hands-on workshop around TLS as well. Go talk to Bart Prenier. Bart will have talks on, on cryptographic storage. Awesome. I'll give you one note before I move on. If you're going to store sensitive data and you need to do cryptography, how should you do cryptography as a developer today? Should you be using your language features and do cryptographic storage by hand? What should you be doing? You should be using a well-vetted library to do cryptographic work for you at the very minimum. That's one of many steps you need to take. And in the world today, what good security libraries are there out there that do good cryptographic storage? Most of them are crap. In the world of Java, there's only two libraries I endorse. One is called Google Keysar. They're using older school mechanisms. It's no longer well maintained, but they've gone out of their way to do it very well. So that's, that's an older library. And probably the more recent library, based on Dan Bernstein's cryptographic work at University of Chicago, written by Adam Lauhill, is called Libsodium. Libsodium is using all the best modern techniques in cryptographic storage. I highly recommend you use that work. If you try to do it yourself from hand, you will almost definitely fail. Some of the best cryptographers in the world cannot do applied cryptography well. It's extremely difficult. Again, one tiny mistake and your whole crypto system is gone. So if you see yourself calling AES from the language at a low level by hand yourself, you're almost always doing it wrong. Use a well-vetted library. And if your language doesn't have a well-vetted library for cryptography like Ruby on Rails, then don't use it. Move to a real language that has one. A lot of these languages you use today to build websites are toys. Ruby on Rails is a freaking toy. You should not use it for real enterprise secure development. It's a big pile of crap. Yet we, yet we, it's, it's so easy to get started with it and get an app out the door 
then you start, but the, when, when you, then you need to do real complexity and hard things with it, like a complex data model or a real advanced cryptography, and it all breaks down. So stop using toy languages. Use a real enterprise language if you need to do good cryptography. I don't mean to say that in a rude way, but it's, it's, it's the reality. Ruby on Rail just pushed out a new cryptographic layer, which has at least two major amateur mistakes in it, which are going to persist for years. So keep away from the toy garbage languages. Use a real language. Anybody here like depend like really deep in Ruby on Rails and I just offended you? I am sorry. I'm not trying to offend you, but your framework is a pile of garbage. Let's <laughs> let's let's move on. Number seven, number, and, and if any of you who spent years working on Ruby on Rails, you will agree with me. Anyone here tried to ram a complex data model into Ruby on Rails app? You've already felt that pain. It's not made for that, it's not made for complexity. Let me stop now. I'm gonna breathe a little bit, breathe in, breathe in. Yes, yo. Please, I love tongue in cheek snarky questions. Definitely. I, I, I'm the owner of Breakman Pro. That's my company with other people. And, and we, let me tell you, the team of us, Neil Matatal, myself, and, and Dr. Dr. Justin Collins, who all built and the company Breakman Pro, the only company that has this Ruby on Rails static analyzer, all three of us, we hate Ruby on Rails with deep passion. We would never, ever use it in the real world because of how horrifically bad it is to, to deal with complexity. If I wanted to do quick toy prototype, we would rock it out. Then we want to actually push it live. We would put that toy away and use an adult language like Java or something else. But Ruby on Rails is not meant for complexity. It's meant for prototyping. And even if you're using static analysis, it just breaks, just from a functionality point of view, yo, it breaks down. It doesn't support the complexity that modern languages support today. It doesn't do it well at all. And when you find yourself in that position, you know what you're doing next? You're now debugging the Ruby on Rails framework to fix the problems, and that is the path to hell and a path to wasted time and effort. So just if you need to do a quick little prototype or you have a very basic app with no chance of complexity in the future, go for it. Otherwise, keep away from this new junk. I I'm sorry, I gotta stop now. This, this is a, whew, okay, okay. Let's charge on. Air handling and logging. There's all these different neat tricks you can do for app layer intrusion detection to embed traps in your code to detect when attackers are trying to attack you. Uh, let's just do one real quick. This is my favorite. When you're building a shopping cart, anytime I build a shopping cart, I put a hidden variable in the user interface that shows the price of that item, right? Hidden variable, price, and the actual number. $22.37 for the Star Wars figurine, whatever. Suppose you're a hacker and you go look at my shopping cart and you see the order page or you see the add item page for a Star Wars figure, and you do view source, and you see a quantity drop-down field, you see a SKU ID, and you see the price as a hidden field. You can't help it. What are you going to try to do? You're going to change that price. You just can't help yourself. But in my code, the price hidden field is not meant to drive the price. It's just a canary. It's just a canary in the coal mine. I'm tricking you into messing with that price. Because on the back end, I'll just map the price with the SKU and see if it changes. And if it changes, I'm going to lock your account. You're done. I actually implemented this in a pretty popular search engine, in a pr pretty popular e-commerce engine a couple years back. And it ended up being on slick deals that, that this was now possible. And suddenly, like, 5% of accounts got locked that day. And, and my boss was like, you know, Jim, that was a great idea. Nice. Can you turn it off now, please? I'm like, uh, all right, thank you. And there's a great project in Java called App Sensor, which will allow you in a, in a very well-written professional library. This is written by John Melton. This was originally written by Michael Coates as it, when he was an academic. It was a great, uh, uh, no offense to academics. Let me just rewind a bit. Let's rewind a bit. 
It, it was written by Michael Coates when he was a student, right? So it's like an amateur piece of code with a good idea. John Melton, who's a professional developer for like Wells Fargo and other big companies, John Melton took the code, made version two of it, and per completely locked it down. It's very professional, well-written, well-documented. This is a great library to embed sensors in your code to detect when you're under attack in non-standard ways. This is really well thought out library. It's worth taking a look at for those of you in the Java world. Number eight, what's my time, like five minutes? Seven, great. Number eight, this is very critical. Leverage security features of your frameworks and security libraries. If you are gonna use these different frameworks, Struts, Spring, <coughs> Ruby on Rails, whatever you're gonna use, become a master of that framework. You have to understand how to use those embedded controls so you're not rewriting the wheel, not reinventing the wheel from scratch. Modern frameworks are doing a better job at providing controls. You need to master them. And, and let me take a step back for a second. What do you think is gonna be more secure overall? Using a third party framework or using your own custom framework? I feel that using more modern frameworks is gonna be more secure. But every study I've seen has said the opposite, is that when you build a simple, lightweight framework for your own application or organization, the long-term security of that framework is gonna be radically more robust than using third-party frameworks. And this is counterintuitive to what I believe personally. And here's the logic behind that. When you build your own lightweight framework for your applications, how easy it is you to modify the framework code of that software? It's straightforward because you wrote it. Your team wrote it. So when you have to dive into the framework to fix issues, it's a doable task and that's critical. You're always gonna have to dive into your framework code. If you're using Spring, there will come a day where you will be forced to dive into Spring's code and it's a freaking ball of me messy, difficult code to read. And so you're gonna be stuck. You're gonna be, you're gonna usually, be, you're usually gonna do anything you can to keep away from that is what ends up happening philosophically in many situations. If you're building your own light work framework, lightweight framework, you have the talent to quickly dive into that framework within your team and adding controls when things go wrong becomes, and finding bugs when things go wrong becomes much more straightforward for your team. It might be more difficult to build it up front, but who cares? You're gonna, you're gonna buy that time back in your maintenance phase, which is the real cost of software. You don't pay for building software, you pay for maintaining it over time for the most part. Something to think about. Number nine, we are, I already mentioned this, security requirements. Philosophy is good, it's a good place to start, but make sure your developers, your assessment team, your hackers, your, um, your, uh, your pen testers, your management, that everybody in your tech team has the same definition for what secure software is by having a list of requirements for security features and, and non-functional requirements for security that we all agree upon. Now we're all moving in the same direction in the pursuit of, of secure software. The standard I, I, I propose, the standard that I, I worked on, I'm a, one of the lead authors of it, is the ASVS standard. <coughs> I'm not suggesting you use it out of the box. I'm suggesting you take the 200 ASVS requirements and fork them for your specific team and application. Last but not least, security architecture and design. I'm not gonna go into this right now. There'll be plenty, plenty of talks about good software secure design throughout the week today. And last note, just because you're here, it's a good sign. You're here because, again, either you care about secure software or your boss is forcing you to care about secure software, and both of those are a good thing. I hope that this week is gonna be of great benefit to you in your career. This is not an easy week. Just this one talk alone is fatiguing most of you in the room, right? We're just getting started though. So again, please drink your coffee. Take this week seriously. Take a lot of notes. Ask a lot of questions. Drink in the, drink in the milk and fruits of knowledge this week. 
and pass it on as you go. I promise you, this is, this is not an end. This is a beginning to your studies. Spend the rest of your career studying secure software, and the benefits will be dramatic. Again, thank you so much for being here. Have a great week. Any questions before we finish up, though? Any questions about anything we just talked about? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Not, not yes, but yes. Thank you. Like what? Bring it on. Give me an example. You're saying you're talking about password storage. Usually, I need a lot of knowledge to do a proof. I don't know. I don't understand the zero knowledge proof. Okay. So. Uh, the, 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 just out of my realm, out of my realm of understanding and my realm of study, the, the common wisdom today is to use an adaptive algorithm for password storage in addition to a keyed solution. So you, if you look at real password storage systems like Dropbox or Facebook, they do two things. They first use an adaptive slow algorithm. Why, why am I telling you to use a slow algorithm in the first place? So when the attackers steal your password, they can't do a trillion hits per second. They can do like a thousand hits per second with the same hardware. We're just slowing them down. So step one, use an adaptive algorithm, one way adaptive algorithm that's slow on purpose or a password hashing function. Not a hashing function, a password hashing function like bcrypt, scrypt, pbkdf2, or the newest from the standard body, argon2i, in addition to a keyed solution, either AES, Galois counter mode done right, or, or HMAC, if you want to use a one-way algorithm. Usually, most experts, I've seen Facebook has published their work, Alex Muffet, um, Dropbox published their work, they call their encryption a pepper and a salt, which is shameful. They all recommend both a keyed solution and an adaptive hash. That's the best research I know of today. Anything else? Let's talk about in the hallway. I, I, don't, I don't understand anything beyond that, or I haven't read about it. Yes, yes, Professor. Go ahead, go ahead. Doesn't matter. Assaulted SHA-1 password is crackable in almost real time. It's, it's horrifically bad. So they're not, so, so they're not doing salting. A hard-coded salt, when they have a hard-coded salt, they're now just doing a hash. I can now build my own rainbow table specific to that one salt and hit the table in one scan, game over, in real time. Yes, you do. Stop. Stop for a second. You do not have to teach your 300 developers to do password storage correctly. You should take your one architect and teach them to do it correctly and make sure that nobody else on the team touches your authentication code. If you have a situation where any 300 developers can start messing with your authentication layer, you're already fucked. You already have a process problem, a management problem, a, you, you have a non-disciplined software engineering team. So it's not even about security. You have basic process problems if you allow any developer to touch authentication code and push it live. That's a bigger problem. It's a process problem. We'll talk about it later. Thank you all for being here. Go write, go learn and write secure code. Have, enjoy your week. Thank you very much, everyone.